Although the actual origin of crochet is unknown, perhaps during the 16th century, the earliest known written reference to crochet is from 1812, as it was becoming more popular. Crochet is a relatively young entrant into the fiber arts, especially when you consider that spinning, the oldest fiber art, dates to 20,000 BC. Some historians believe that crocheting was late to the game because it uses more material than knitting in many other fiber arts, and because fiber was hard to produce until the invention of the spinning jenny in 1764, and later the spinning mule, crocheting was just too expensive for the average person at that time. Fiber art is a style of fine art which uses textiles such as fabric and yarn and natural and synthetic fibers. Other fiber arts include knitting, weaving, quilting, lace making, tatting, not to be confused with lace making, embroidery, rope making, macrame, paracord, spinning, rug making, rug hooking, felting, and yes, shoe making. Bet you didn't think of that one. Wait a minute. Lace making and tatting are not the same, but my grandma always used both terms for the same project she was doing. Actually, they are quite different. Most specifically, they use different tools and tatting is created with knots, while lace making is created by looping the string rather than knotting it. Lace making is a form of crochet. Now for today's most smartest question. Artist Nathan Vincent is widely regarded for creating works that represent masculine objects in a new and softer medium. He is well known for a particular project that he created by crocheting and knitting. What did he make? A replica of a Chevy Corvette? A table saw? A locker room? Or a miniature baseball stadium? In addition to the well-known Crochet a Worry Worm campaigns, other grassroots movements within the crochet community include Knots of Love, which has donated nearly 400,000 crocheted hats to those going bald due to chemotherapy. Knots of Love also donates blankets for premature babies. Also, a charity called Knitted Knockers, founded by Barbara Demarest. Members of Knitted Knockers create handmade breast prosthesis for women who have undergone mastectomies and other procedures. They even offer a free pattern for crocheted boobs. What amazing causes! You will find many other health-related charities like these within the fiber arts community. Speaking of health-related, crocheting can reduce the risk of Alzheimer's by 30 to 50 percent. In addition, crocheting has been proven to help with insomnia, stress, anxiety, and depression. Why isn't everyone working with you? Other health benefits of fiber arts include lowering your blood pressure as well as improving circulation to your hands, which helps keep you limber. When we use both of our hands in different ways simultaneously, it stimulates our brain, giving us a great mental workout. As mentioned, while crochet has many proven health benefits, injuries do occur. There is even a medical code used by hospitals across the U.S. to designate when a crochet injury has occurred. It is code Y93D1. In January of 2016, while playing outside her home, a Chinese toddler fell headfirst onto a crochet hook that pierced her brain. After x-rays, doctors discovered the hooked needle had penetrated through her eye socket and lodged into her brain. Fortunately, doctors were able to remove the metal hook and the little girl recovered. Not all crochet hooks are made of metal. They are also made of bamboo, plastic, and resin, as well as woods such as maple, teak, ebony, purple heart, and beech. Early crochet and knitting needles were often made of bone and sometimes ivory. It also was not unusual for crochet artists to use broken forks or spoons and fashioning them into hooks. How creative! The basic difference between knitting and crochet is that with crochet, each stitch is completed before moving on to the next. With knitting, many stitches can be kept open at the same time. There are many different styles utilized by crochet artists. Tunisian, corner to corner, also known as C2C, Suzette, single, double, triple, herringbone, lemon peel, broomstick lace, shell stitch, trinity, fan, and Jacob's ladder, just to name a few. The number of crochet stitches is nearly mind-boggling. 
Another form of crochet is called Irish crochet. It literally helped elevate the Irish people out of the potato famine of 1845 to 1850. Ursuline nuns taught local Irish women how to crochet. Their version of crochet became immensely popular and provided much needed income for suffering families. Prior to crochet patterns being consistently written down, stitches were passed along by simply copying someone else's work. Samples were often made and bound into scrapbooks, kept together in a bag, or sewn onto large pieces of fabric. My personal favorite is that school children would stitch their favorites into long, narrow bands of work and add to this long band throughout their lives when they learned a new stitch. It is fascinating that some Spanish nuns still utilize these narrow bands for examples to this day. These long, narrow bands explain why, even to this day, you can purchase bound crochet stitch books where the stitches have no names. When you crocheted the stitch as an example for yourself, that is what you had. Figure it out. The individual stitch names were lost over the years. The first actual printed crochet pattern appeared in 1823 in the Dutch magazine named Penelope. Penelope printed five distinctly styled purses. Most of those patterns used silk as the yarn. Silk purse was a common term of that age. In the early 1800s, crochet gained even more popularity due to efforts by Mademoiselle Riego de la Branchardiere. She was particularly fond and successful at taking old style needle and bobbin lace designs and turning them into crochet patterns that could easily be duplicated. She published many pattern books, allowing millions of women to copy her designs. She also claimed to have invented the style that today we call Irish crochet. In modern times, the vast majority of crochet and fiber arts patterns and instructions are published to and found on the internet, making almost anything accessible to those wanting to learn fiber arts skills. And now for today's most smartest answer. Believe it or not, Mr. Vincent crocheted and knitted a full-size locker room, complete with showers and urinals. Pretty amazing. Even though it is much easier now to find patterns, it is often still difficult to read them. Why? Crochet has its own language, making it difficult for beginners. Not only do beginners have to understand the various stitches, but to progress beyond that, they must understand how to read the patterns. For example, CH1, SC in next three STSs, SK2 STS, 5DC in the next, SK2 STS, SC in the next, would mean chain one, then single crochet in the next three stitches, skip two stitches, and work five double crochet in the next stitch, skip two more stitches, and single crochet in the next stitch. Wow, did you get that? There are even differences between how to write crochet patterns in the US and the UK. A few examples. In the US, DC equals the UK TR. USTR equals UK DTR, double treble. USSC equals the UK DC, and USHDC equals the UK HTR, half treble crochet. Getting good at crochet is almost like learning a new language. Although crochet is often seen as one of the more expensive yarn arts, regardless of which side of the pond you are on, it is fairly inexpensive nowadays. A nice metal hook will cost you about $2 US, and a quality skein of yarn can easily be found for less than $5 US. No excuses, new crocheters. Other styles of hooks can be much more expensive, although they really are not necessary. For example, many ergonomic hooks can sell for $10 to $20 a piece, with some brands going as high as $100 for a single hook. You might not need one of those the first time you crochet. In addition, crocheting requires about one-third more yarn than knitting, with the cost of yarn being the largest expense for any project. Inexpensive yarns made from acrylic start around two to four dollars a skein. Higher quality acrylics and wool will run five to eighteen dollars each, while some imported or rare yarns can be twenty to forty dollars or more per skein. The choices are almost endless. Due to crochet taking more yarn than knitting, for example, the popularity of crocheting tends to decline during economic downturns. During those times, crocheters tend to try to cut back on their passion. 
Although the popularity of crocheting is highly impacted by the economy, never in the 20th century was it more popular than in the late 1960s and into the 1970s when it was associated with the hippie movement. Far out, man. Beginning in 2011, crocheting began to overtake knitting in popularity. According to Google, the number of crochet-related searches is growing exponentially, while searches for knitting have been falling drastically in comparison. Although crocheters in the US and the UK are quick to claim the title of the world's top crocheters, neither area even makes the top five. The majority of the top five crochet nations are in South America, with Argentina firmly having the lead. In early 2016, Guinness World Records recognized that a group of crocheters calling themselves Mother India's Crochet Queens made the largest crochet blanket in the world, measuring 120,000 square feet. Over 1,000 participants aged 8 to 85 from 14 countries contributed. The blanket was taken apart and the individual squares were given to those in need. What is one of the fastest growing forms of graffiti? It is called yarn bombing or yarn graffiti. The graffiti artists practice their creativity by using yarn to cover various objects in the front yards of homes, including bushes and trees. Does that make you think of your front yard getting TP'd in high school? It shouldn't, it's not even close. The art of yarn bombing utilizes the art of crochet.